glad to see that you're all looking really so well. I've walked around all the tables and it's amazing. The, the one thing that has happened in the seven intervening years since the first one, as I was telling Ken Searson recently, I now have to wear glasses to read the notes that are in front of me. So if I may now just refer to our guest speaker, because it's time to introduce him. We're fortunate enough again to have a visitor from, uh, from overseas. The uh, attraction of our conference now is such that many people seek to visit us and speak with us. And our visit this morning is from uh, Professor Morris Lupino, who is in Australia on a flying visit. His purpose is to confer with New South Wales and Victorian companies on the very important subject of business practices. Born in London, and with a background in statistics, Professor Lupino worked with Morgan Gallup Polls in the US for some seven years. He moved into management, working at executive level with an imperial life in London, and then moving to the Northern and Midland Bank and his headquarters, its headquarters in Leeds. While there, the professor taught at Leeds University. He created what became a famous three-year course called Management Meets the Real World. The course is still running today. Three years ago, Professor Lupino joined Lester and Phillips as a consultant in the UK, advising companies worldwide on management and sales. He is the author of a new book titled Big Business, Small Minds, <laughs> to be published in 1996 by Hamilton Press, a must read. He is much in demand in the UK as a witty speaker on business practice, which is why we feel privileged to have persuaded him to talk at this very special breakfast this morning. <coughs> Professor Lupino calls his talk, Management Towards 2000, Are We Going Back to the Future? Please welcome Professor Morris Lupino. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be back in Australia. I come here quite often. My sister-in-law lives in Taramara in Sydney. I am, as was said in my introduction, a consultant. And a consultant has been often described as a man who knows 87 ways to make love, but doesn't know any women. <laughs> and in one sense, that is true. But a consultant often sees more of the game, looking as he does from the outside. And the question I ask is this, are you looking to the future? Because the future is where we are going to spend the rest of our lives. Many people look and they fail to see. Mercedes, they're engineers, they went to college, they're intelligent, they look to the future. What did they miss? Lexus. Encyclopedia Britannica, they're clever, they're even well-read. They look to the future. What did they miss? CD-ROM. What are you missing in the superannuation area? Anyone's cash cow can be stolen, including yours. If you don't think so, look at IBM. A few years ago, IBM lost billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. How did they miss the personal computer? Was it because people at IBM are really stupid? I don't think so. How smart you are has very little to do with how successful you're going to be in the future. If you got a PhD seven years ago, it only means you used to know something. <laughs> what things need to change? I'm very surprised with quite a few things in your industry here in Australia, the insurance industry especially, how under-regulated you are, for instance. I know you have some compliance, but is it enough? In the UK, they have very sensibly instigated a Financial Services Act. This requires companies to reveal much more about themselves to potential clients and to clients. It has resulted in a drop in sales, but it gave the industry greater reliability. People who once saw insurance as a shonky business now perceive it as much more honest, even if they don't buy so much. <laughs> Something you could well do with in the superannuation business here in Australia. 
Let me say this. It is wonderful to have so many leaders of industry in one place. Very seldom does one find so many powerful people together in one room. According to my briefing, I am talking to trustees and fund managers and administrators and taxation officials and lawyers and insurance company executives listed there in descending order of the social scale. <laughs> such powerful people, you must ask yourself, what is wrong with the corporate co co culture today, the corporate culture? It is an important question, and that includes executives of all types of companies and government bodies represented here today. I will tell you what's wrong. So many of you have been led down an erroneous path by the books of people like Stephen Covey and Robert De Silva, and leadership is going, if I may say so, down the gurgler. The paradigm shift that was attempted in the 80s was to do with moving away from unilateral problem solving to group problem solving. Patently, it has not worked. Are you still using those 80s cliché words? I mean, what was business like before everything became excellent? Quality, commitment, have they not lost their significance? Can anybody in this room actually tell me what commitment means? Of course you can't. My point is this, the constant line, Kobe and De Silva again, has been that people who produce good results feel good about themselves. And what do we get? Just look at results. We get people who feel good about themselves, but apathetic about the company. And apathy, my friends, is the enemy of profit. The question is, how can managers lead the way? Not follow, lead. There is an old saying, never play leapfrog with a unicorn. <laughs> but with these wishy-washy techniques, that's what people in business are doing. We are con all conditioned by our experience. Does the name Pavlov ring a bell? However, ask yourself this. If the man who invented the drawing board had got it wrong, what would we have gone back to? <laughs> People in business are in the same position today. Run your company like some happy farm and soon you will have no drawing board, no point of reference, nowhere to go back and reassess. Another word that is often quoted and is so boring, teamwork. The word team in business merely means that the company has moved into decentralization. Now, a well-proven democratic way of going broke. The ideal system of management was defined by the British film director, Michael Winner, and he said, a team effort is a lot of people doing what I say. <laughs> An executive I know found out the problem in his company was poor communication. He said, how come nobody told me? <laughs> There's a man who's one steroid short of a gold medal. <laughs> this particular convention is not a time for selling, I know that. This is a time for insurance companies to indulge in demonstrating to trustees, intriguing them, setting up a platform for future negotiations which boils down to the usual corporate cultural cringe where the supplier sucks up to the customer. <laughs> and don't you just love that, trustees, don't you, eh? The average executive anywhere loves anything that gives him power. Power over the expert from the insurance company is even better, eh, guys? You can give them stick, and all they can say is, yes, but. <laughs> and it doesn't stop there. The trustees need to keep AMP and Rothschild and Colonial Mutual and the rest in line. And who do they have to keep in line? Who do you have to keep in line? Your customers. Unfortunately, you have to find people who will invest money. Or you will have to find mugs who will let you manage their money. This is the nitty gritty, dealing with a man or woman who pays the premium. You call it customer service, I call it customer discipline. Customers need to be motivated as much as the employee does. You tell them what to do, they do it. Because as you know, all customers are basically idiots. 
In supermarkets and shopping malls all over the world, consumers buy goods and services on impulse. Impulse conditioned mainly by advertising, by perception, but basically by ignorance. Anybody with any sense knows all soap is the same. The only difference is the perfume and the advertising. The same goes for selling any form of insurance. The essence of shifting your service depends on the salesman, or as we say today, salesperson. And in the modern corporate world, we are all salespersons from the CEO to the receptionist. But some executives will only talk to other executives. Snobbery is rife in business. Executives think if they walk out of their boardrooms, rather than Mercedes-Benz, they may trip over a beggar and land with their face in a puddle. I know I do. <laughs> face it, you've got to come up with new ideas, get off your backsides and sell. Look at members' choice. Should a purchaser of a superannuation plan actually choose their fund manager, or even worse, direct that fund manager in what to do? It's their money. Surely they should be allowed to work out what to do with it. And you say, what a good idea, how democratic. We just love to have some total idiot on the phone half the day saying, I've just read in the paper, property is good, let's sell the shares we bought yesterday and put the money in property where we had it last week before we bought the shares. <laughs> oh yes, you say you're in favour, but what you'd really like to get the idiot who came up with Member's Choice with a big, sharp hatchet. <laughs> Just remember those words written in the Bible. The big print giveth, and the small print taketh away. <laughs> but we can hardly call that selling, can we? Listen to me. I'm not in this for my health. I'm not saying this for my health. There are five paradigms of human interaction. Win-win, lose-lose, win-lose, lose-win, no deal, or just plain win. <laughs> now, the fashionable approach is the win-win situation. Call me old-fashioned. I just can't see it. In business, the object is to win. Not lose-win or lose-lose, just win. Sell the product, get the biggest house, have the most toys, retire at 45. Tell Rupert Murdoch about the win-win situation. I don't think so. So you must learn the three basic elements of selling. They're very simple. One, you must be able to solve your customers' problems. Two, you must be able to uncover problems where the prospect thinks no problem exists. Three, you must, if necessary, create problems that you can then solve. <laughs> Selling to a consumer in a supermarket or a shop is done by subterfuge. Selling superannuation and associated services needs cunning, manipulation, dishonesty, and frequently bribes. <laughs> so what is the future? What are you missing while you're busy promoting teamwork and other dopey ideas? Thank goodness for the information superhighway. It has come along like the cavalry at the end of a John Wayne movie. But you must ask yourself this question, and I want you to be honest as you answer it. Do you need your children to help you program your VCR? <laughs> if you do, you may not have a future. <laughs> One thing is clear. Children are playing computer games while they are still in the cradle. They are a friend of the computer. If you are 30 or over, think on this. The 10-year-old will be out of the school and into the workforce in less than 10 years. Do you want a 20-year-old knowing more than you do? You will have to understand the superhighway and the new technology, like it or not. But then again, is it hype? Is the future coming up with things that appear to simplify life, but really complicate it? We live in a world where you phone somebody reach their answering machine, which tells you to call their mobile. So you phone their mobile, which tells you are being diverted to another number, which turns out to be their answering machine. <laughs> which tells you to call their mobile. I am suffering, you are suffering, we are all suffering from what, from what the um, medical profession calls appliance stress. We are into information overload. If there wasn't enough trouble already with the battle of the sexes, technology is getting in there too. 
Already we are seeing differences in the way men and women handle technology. Look at the different way they watch television. There is a joke going around. How do you get a man to do sit-ups? You put the remote control between his feet. <laughs> men don't want to know what's on television. Men want to know what else is on television. <laughs> Women tend to stay on the same channel. They are more nurturing. They say it's a bad program, but give it a chance, it may improve. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of leadership, may I add a codicil? Many executives consider that their main function in life, apart from selecting their new BMWs, is to write memos. I know I do. But at least I write good memos, and I write great reports. But the average CEO has the writing skills of a nine-year-old with a behaviour problem. <laughs> this is probably the area that needs to be addressed most in leadership. Most of you can't put a sentence together that doesn't read like it came out of the Oxford Dictionary of Clichés. So may I make a few suggestions? I know I sound like Mrs. Fazakali from the English class, but honestly, people, you really need it. A few hints. Never use a long word when a diminutive one will do. <laughs> also, avoid awkward or affected alliteration. <laughs> Don't use no double negatives. <laughs> Take the ball by the hand and don't mix metaphors. <laughs> Never, ever, 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 ever use repetitive redundancies. <laughs> Last but not least, avoid cliches like the plague. <laughs> and if I told you once, I told you a million times, no exaggeration. You need these skills. Because towards 2000, globalisation is the name of the game. More and more countries are doing business with more and more countries. We must be able to see and communicate who is doing good and doing well and with whom. It gives credence to the old saying about heaven and hell. Heaven is where the chefs are Brit French, the police are British, the mechanics are German, the lovers are Italian and the organisers are Swiss. Hell is where the chefs are British, the police are German, the mechanics are French, the lovers are Swiss, and it's all organised by the Italian. The new world, the information superhighway, will affect even our personal lives. Show me a man who comes home early every night, is greeted with smiles, has his hat taken off, his coat taken off, his shoes taken off, pillows arranged to make him feel comfortable, and is then served a really delicious meal, and I will show you a man who lives in a Japanese restaurant. <laughs> It's all happening here in Australia. I come here, as I said, quite often. I arrived last week, British Airways, full of English people, the airplane was. You could tell that because the whining continued after the engines had stopped. <laughs> this is Australia, land of opportunity, the only place a person could arrive without knowing the language, without knowing the geography, and within an hour and a half be driving a taxi cab. <laughs> Course, but I didn't know it was the slang. It was a funny slang here, aren't you? Bonza, this is a strange word. I said to an Australian, what's bonza? He said, a busload of poms driving over a cliff. <laughs> English people are not popular here. I, I know that. I, I do know that. I was talking earlier to Trevor Carter about popularity. And Trevor said, nobody likes me. <coughs> I said, be fair, Trevor, not everybody has met you. <laughs> I 
I love all. I love Tasmania, especially everybody been to Tasmania. It's wonderful there. I went there on a farmhouse holiday. I arrived. The farmer met me at the door. He said, "I would like you to meet my wife and my sister." And there's just this one woman standing. <laughs> I know we have people from Sydney here, that's where I usually stay in Sydney, it's a lovely place. I love Rooty Hill, that's a lovely place. I go there twice a year to visit my hubcaps. <laughs> Double Bay, where the posh people live, when they make love, they say to each other, I'm arriving. <laughs> gay bars, the singles bars in Oxford Street, the only problem there I find is there's always 15 men to every man. <laughs> and King's Cross. I was there recently. There's terrible problems they're having there in King's Cross. And this young woman sidled up to me and she said, I will do anything you want for a hundred dollars that you can describe in three words. I said, paint my house. <laughs> I say are controversial, but a man of my age, I feel, can speak from experience as mature men. Would you agree, Neil Tuncliffe? Where are you, Neil? <laughs> Neil, where are you? Can I say, can you put your hand up, Neil, please? Oh, you are putting your hand up. Oh, there you are, Neil. Sorry. When we get old, we can't see each other anyway. <laughs> Do you find, Neil, now you're a mature man, you find that when you park your car in a tight space, you feel sexually satisfied for the day? <laughs> You do, yeah. You know how old it's when you bend down to do up your shoelaces and you think, is there anything else I can do when I'm down here? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my back goes out more than I do. I... Do you find you sleep in the day? No. I sleep in the day. I Yesterday, I, I, I fell asleep and I dreamed about your politician. I dreamt that Paul Keating was in one car and he was driving through Canberra. And coming towards him in another guy were John Howard and Romney Bishop. And they crashed and they died. And they went to heaven and they saw God. And God said, who are you? He said, I'm Paul Keating, Prime Minister of Australia. God said, come and sit on my right hand. He said, who are you? Uh, he said, I'm John Howard, leader of the opposition. God said, come and sit on my left hand. He said, who are you? She said, I'm Romney Bishop and you're in my seat. <laughs> To be effective in serving the public in these days of change, basic principles have not altered. You must understand people. You must get deep into their soul. Because people nowadays are not satisfied. Curly-haired people want to be straight. Straight-haired people want to be curly. And bald-headed men want everybody to be blind. <laughs> people are very concerned about their health. It doesn't matter when you start being concerned about your health. My Aunt Grace, at the age of 65, started running five miles a day. She's now 93 years old and we don't know where the hell she is. <laughs> I stay fit myself every day. I exercise through a Jane Fonda video. Right now I'm using On Golden Pond. <laughs> I went to my doctor and said, how do you get fit? He said, it's psychological. What you have to do is think fit. So I went out swimming, think fit. I went skipping, think fit. I went jogging, think fit. I woke up in the hospital. I said to the nurse, what happened? She said, we think you had a fit. <laughs> People worry about a lot of things. They, they, um, they worry about drinking, how much they drink. I know the I found the difference between a drunk and an alcoholic. A drunk doesn't have to go to all those meetings. <laughs> Couldn't get any booze, poor fellow. Didn't have any money. Drank an entire bottle of Windex. In the morning he had a terrible hangover, but his eyes were so clear. <laughs> People are very concerned about lawyers. You must know that in your business. Lawyers, well, I mean, you must deal with them all the time. We do in this business, and it's such a way. 
Fortunately, I, I, I know there are lawyers here today, so you'll be very pleased to know I do not know any lawyer's lawyers. I do, however, know a rabbi's lawyer. A rabbi and a Hindu and a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Their car broke down on a moor. And it was windy and it was raining and they went to the farmer and the farmer said, I can put you up up there and put two of you up, one of you will have to sleep in the barn. So they sent the rabbi to the barn. Five minutes later, there was a knock on the door. It was the rabbi. He said, I cannot sleep in the barn. There is a pig in the barn. It is against my religion. So they sent the Hindu. Five minutes later, there was a knock on the door. It was the Hindu. He said, there is a cow in the barn. I cannot sleep in the barn. It is against my religion. So they sent the lawyer. Ten minutes later, there was a knock on the door. It was the pig and the cow. <laughs> now I realize there are people here from all over, and people who worry that people will laugh at them from, because of where they come from. People from Queensland. There are people here from Queensland, where the official state game is North Drosses, or as you call it, circles and signatures. <laughs> people from the outback, where Tiny Kangaroo Down Sport is considered a love song. <laughs> people from Darwin, where the major form of birth control is nudity. Don't worry that you come from these places. It's, 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 quite, it's quite. People worry about their retirement. <coughs> when am I going to retire? What am I going to do? And especially in your business. Retirement is a very big thing. A man I know, he decided what he would do is start a pig, a pig farm, a pig farm. So he bought some pigs, a lot of pigs. And he called the vet, and the vet came around and he said, do you realize what you have here is all female pigs? He said, but well, I, I, I was going to breed them. He said, but well, they're all female pigs. So I'll tell you what, Charlie down the road has got some male pigs. Take your pigs down to Charlie and, and make a deal with him and, and see what happens. So next day, made a deal with Charlie, took all the pigs, put them in the truck, female pigs, took them down to Charlie, left them in the field for the day, put them back in the truck in the evening, came back. Next day, he found out the vet. He said, how will I know if this works, what we've done with the male pigs, the female pigs? He said, well, look out the window. If they are eating the grass, it means it's taken, because female pigs eat very, very maternal. So he looked out the window, and the female pigs were all just laying on one. So he put them in the truck, took them down to Charlie, left them in the field with the male pigs, put them in the truck at the end of the day, came back. Next day, he said to his wife, he said, listen, I can't bear to put those in the truck and take them all the way down. He said, look out the window and see what they're doing. So she looked out the window, he said, are they all eating the grass? She said, no, they're sitting in the back of the van and one of them is blowing the horn. <laughs> Relationships. Oh, I do go on about relationships. People say to me, do I believe in love? Certainly I believe in love. When you're in love, it's the most glorious two and a half days of your life. <laughs> I've been married twice, a triumph of optimism over experience. In between marriages, I went out a lot with homeless women. So I found it was easier to get them to stay over. <laughs> I went out with an older woman once. One night I told her to act her age, so she died. <laughs> Married now to the lovely Patricia, my second wife, she's an expert on ancient Greece. Never cleans the oven. <laughs> we have a little problem, she says I'm nosy. She says I'm the nosiest person in the entire world. Well, she didn't actually say it, but she wrote it in her diary. <laughs> my first wife and I, we had trouble with our sex life, I wanted one. We. <laughs> We went to a marriage counsellor, he suggested what we should do was pool our interests, share our interests. So every Saturday night, we had a combined orgy and Tupperware party. <laughs> People worry, are they far enough up the social scale? You know, I mean, it's, it's people do silly things. At my local Chinese restaurant, I've got my own chopsticks with my initials on one end and Velcro on the other. <laughs> 
people got the latest mobile phones. You're all on that now, aren't you? Have you got the latest mobile phone? <coughs> Executives sitting around saying, mine's smaller than yours. <laughs> but it lasts longer. <laughs> it's been a very, very busy time for me here in Australia. I've, um, I've got Monday. Monday I was driving my car and um, my, uh, my brakes gave up on the top of a hill. The mechanic said, you must have lost a lot of fluid. I said, wouldn't you? <laughs> Tuesday, I watched F Oprah Winfrey. We don't have Oprah Winfrey. It's, it's a very interesting. There's a, program, a woman on the program. She went to a doctor who told her she only had 12 hours to live. She went home to her husband. She said, darling, I only had 12 hours to live, but I'll tell you what I want us to do. I want us to have a candlelight dinner, go to bed, and make love all night. He said, that's all right for you. You don't have to get up in the morning. <laughs> On Wednesday, I went to see a politically correct version of the musical Guys and Dolls. Politically correct version of Guys and Dolls called Loathsome Oppressors and Women of Vision and Strength. <laughs> I went to a seminar on Thursday. About coming out of the recession, I'll be coming out of the recession. It's the same in England, I'll be going back. Nobody seems to know. One thing I've noticed companies are taking over other companies, which I think is a very good sign. Pizza Hut has been taken over by Jehovah's Witnesses. You still get your pizza in 30 minutes, but it takes you an hour to get rid of the driver. <laughs> I couldn't afford a new car in the recession. Can you believe that? Things were so bad, I had to buy a second-hand car. They told me only had one owner. Turned out the owner was Hertz. <laughs> but things have got better, and now I've got a new car. A new luxury car. Wonderful. Pride and joy. On the first day, my wife, the lovely Patricia, took it out for a test drive. She phoned me up on the mobile. She said, the airbag works. <laughs> I cannot leave you today without talking to one of the youngest members in the room, one of tomorrow's people. Where are you, Graham Putt? Graham. Graham Putt? Can I see you? Oh, there you are. Stand up, Graham. Stand up. This is the future. Here. I was talking to Graham earlier about his life, and he has managed to get, he's had a very, very difficult life. His parents didn't want him. <laughs> His mother had morning sickness after he was born. <laughs> His father used to say to him, don't speak to strange men, just take the lollies and get in the car. <laughs> Wonderful. He was playing with matches one day. Set fire to the house. They sent him to his room. <laughs> he went through the stage, the stage all boys go through, pimples, you remember that? Woke up in the library one day, found a blind man was reading his face. <laughs> but now he has grown into this lovely, if somewhat naive, young man. Last year, for his holidays, he went to the Virgin Islands. They gave him a hero's welcome. <laughs> First name in his little black book is Zelda. <laughs> He bought, he bought a dog to help him to meet girls. Do you remember that? Then he found out that his dog was help using him to meet other dogs. <laughs> but I want to give you a word of advice. Here in this wonderful world of superannuation, as you go through life, the key word in this business is sincerity. Once you've learned to fake that, the rest is easy. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. The world of superannuation is tough. The public depends on you. Responsibility weighs on your shoulders. You must never lose your sense of humor. I, fortunately, have a humorous parrot to open for Said my parrot, can you talk? He said, certainly, can you fly? And my parrot got Randy. I want you to imagine it's a Randy parrot. I put my hand in to change it, the parrot attacked it. My sister came round, the parrot shouted obscene suggestions. So I took the parrot to the vet. He examined it, he said, sir, what you have here is a Randy parrot. 
But I'll tell you what I'll do. In that cage behind that curtain is a lady parrot. And for $50, I would let you put your parrot in that cage to relieve his frustration. And I said, $50. And the parrot said, it's only money. <laughs> So we handed over the money, we put the parent in the cage, we drew the curtain to give him some privacy, we waited, and after about 10 seconds we had ba-da, 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 and feathers were flying out of the top of the cage, and we rushed over and drew back the curtain, and there was my man parrot with a lady parrot, and he was pulling out her feathers, and he was saying, for $50, I want you naked. <laughs> Enjoy your journey through this world because you will never get out of it alive. <laughs> Some people think that humour is cruel, like one nation laughing at another nation in order to be superior. For instance, I never said Irish jokes. Is there any Irish here? Anybody? Nobody. Son, you're Irish. What's your name, sir? Would you like an easier question? <laughs> You'll understand this. One day, I, I told some Irish jokes, like I'm not doing tonight, and, and, and afterwards, an Irishman came round and attacked me with a razor. Thank God it wasn't plugged in. <laughs> I don't really know, but all over the world, the same jokes are told, but they're told about different nationalities. The, the Americans tell them about the Poles. They're Polish jokes. The French tell them about the Belgians. The, um, the Swedes tell them about the Danes. The Germans tell them about the Italians, the Australians tell them about the New Zealanders, and the New Zealanders just have to own up. <laughs> Is anybody here from New Zealand? Any New Zealand? Uh, you, you're from New Zealand? Oh, wonderful. Uh, where, where are you from? Uh, sorry? No, I heard what you said, I was just saying sorry. <laughs> best sum up these few words of wisdom on the future of business and how it affects it all. I hope I've covered in the time given an overview of this complicated subject. But in these days of the information superhighway and the youth culture, I find we often ignore the words of the older past. I was walking along the road the other day and I came across an old man who was sitting on a bench and he was crying. I said to him, what's the matter old man? She said, like this, she said, like this. I'm 92 years old, and every morning, I, and I recently married this beautiful 27-year-old girl, and she's really lovely, and every morning when we wake up, she leans over, and she strokes me, and we make love. And at lunchtime, she takes me by the hand, and she leads me up to the bedroom, and we make love. And in the afternoon, I go for a walk, and when I get home, I get home, we watch some television, and we go to bed. And if I can manage it, we do it again. And if I can't, she does something beautiful to my body until I fall asleep. I said, that sounds wonderful. What are you crying for? He said, I've forgotten where I live. <laughs> Gentlemen, you have all shared today in a little hoax. I'm not really Maurice Lupino. My name is David Cummings. I'm a comedian. It's a nice job being a comedian because if you fail, at least you don't have people laughing at you. <laughs> You've been a great audience. I shall pass amongst you later if anybody wants my card or kiss me or anything like that. I like to leave you with a quote from one of the best-known figures of the 20th century. Somebody who has affected all our lives, directly or indirectly. And it goes like this. It's easy to smile when your life is worthwhile and the flame in your heart is on fire. But the man who can grin when it's all caving in, he's the man that you have to admire. Adolf Hitler, 
Thank you very much, David. I, I think that applause was what I was going to ask for anyway, but I guess we've had it now. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, we do. Well, come on. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure to personally meet David, let me, let me assure you that he is a delightful individual. He's not only a very funny man, but he's a lovely, lovely person. And he really does have a lovely wife. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, as uh, we've often said before, we hope that it's a great way for you to start the last day of the conference. Our wishes to you are that you take something back with you that you can use in your everyday work, we hope that you have uh, a far better year next year than this year. And I'm not suggesting this year wasn't good. It was very good. But I hope that, you, that next year is even better and the years after. It's been wonderful to be with you. We've enjoyed it immensely. We're glad you came. Have a very, very good day. And be careful going home. Bye-bye. <laughs>